Okay, so now we'll just continue talking about threads. Um, in Java, they kind of make this a little bit simpler than what you might see in a, uh, an operating systems class. But a thread has four states as far as Java is concerned. New is when we're first creating the state. <coughs> I'm sorry, when we're first creating the thread, it's in the new state. That's as it's being constructed. When it eventually gets to the point where it's runnable, and what you might see in an operating systems class is this being called ready. Well, this would actually be ready uh, on the ready queue, whether it's running or not, it's considered runnable. So Java considers a thread that's currently running or is waiting to run, but it's not, it's not waiting for any device or resource or anything like that. It's considered runnable. And if you remember, the interface is called runnable. It's created with that interface. <coughs> Whenever a thread is being, is been put on a waiting queue, meaning it's not running, it moves to a state that they just call block. <coughs> There's a couple ways we could move from being runnable to block, and that means it would now never get any processor time. It would have to, the operating system would have to move it back to the runnable state. We've seen this before where you could do a sleep. So you could, from a thread, you could issue a sleep, sleep five seconds. The, the thread will move into what's considered a block. It's a waiting state. <coughs> what makes it go from the waiting state back to the runnable state is when the time is up, when it's done sleeping. Then uh, <coughs> another thing we could do, and maybe well, I'll show an example. It's not, a, it's not a very intuitive example, but it's a very simple example. But maybe you could think of other examples where you'd want to do this. Let's say the parent thread, which kicked off two children thread, decided for some reason that they want one of the threads to just be stalled. So instead of instead of like doing a sleep for 20 seconds, like we could do within the thread, the parent thread could say, I want one of the children thread to be stalled for 20 seconds. What it could do is issue, it could say for the thread, because remember, we have the thread object, like we have thread one and thread two, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to an example shortly. We could say for that thread, I'm going to call the suspend method. The suspend method is a void, you know, returns nothing, it takes no parameters, you just call suspend. And that would take the child thread and move it into the block state, so it's now waiting. And what would make it go unblock? What would make it start running again? This is a case where the parent thread, who was kind of in control of the children thread, would call the resume method on the same thread, and that would bring it back and start running. <coughs> now another thing, like towards the end of this class, we'll talk about this wait and notify concept, but can you think of off the top of your head a reason why a thread would be running so we've seen the case where a thread is running and decides to go to sleep for a certain amount of time. Then there might be a re reason for that. Like, for example, in our project, we're going to have a clock that keeps updating the time every second. So we go to sleep for one second, then we wake up and we add one second to the time of day, and then go back to sleep and keep doing that forever. So we might be able to, as a thread, anticipate how long we want to go to sleep and exactly when we want to wake up. That might be the way our application works. But can you think of a case where one thread would say, I want to go kind of like going to sleep. There's some reason I have to wait, but I need some other thread to wake me up. In other words, you don't know the exact number of seconds you want to go to sleep. You know that you're waiting for an event, and some other thread would have to know that the event occurred to wake you up. So, anyone think of a real world example? Like, it doesn't have to be in computers, just, you know, any, anything. You have to know what the Exactly. So this would end up being, there's some event, what, what this is typically called like in C and C++ is what they definitely, what they call this is a, a condition variable. There's some condition that you don't know exactly what time it's going to happen, but you know it will eventually happen. So maybe, maybe a, a real world example might be, uh, let's say, think of a supermarket. A supermarket has a bunch of cashiers. So if there's three customers online, Maybe you have one cashier. When it gets to four customers, then a second one starts up. Then, you know, if the line gets really long, you'll have two running. Then if it gets down to three, one of them goes away, you know, something along those lines. So we could have, the threads could end up being cashiers. We start off a bunch of cashiers, and there's a shared variable called number of customers. And if the number of customers, you know, one, one cashier is the one that's always working, and the other cashier works from time to time. So one thread would be saying if the number of customers is 
greater than, uh, I'm sorry, is less than, is three or less, then I'm going to wait. I'm done. I go on break. Right? And then the other thread is saying, oh, it keeps checking. If the number of customers goes four, five, six, then I'm going to wake you up. I'm going to notify you. It's time for you to wake up again. But we can't predict in seconds how long it'll be. It's, it's an event. We don't, maybe no customers will ever show up and they can go to sleep forever. Or they may come back, you know, they may go on break and then right away another customer walks in and we have to wake them up. <clears throat> so this would be a case where you put yourself to sleep by calling wait and somebody else calls notify to wake you back up and then you start running in. So you, you call wait, you go into the block state, some other thread calls notify, you come back. So there might be an application where you want to do that. And then there's other things where you go asking for a resource and the resource isn't available at the moment. You try to open up a file, you can end up getting stuck as soon as the file becomes available, uh, you go back. Okay, so these are the different states. And they try to make it simple. If you've seen operating systems uh, classes, the states are uh, a lot, there's a lot more states to it. But Java tries to keep their state diagram so. Okay, so now we did the, the example three we did last class. This is very similar to it. <coughs> this is a, uh, well, in this one example four in my directory. So what is what happens here? We have a increment thread. So this is similar to the example three last time. We had one thread that kept incrementing a shared variable. Right, just to remember from the last class. We have a count variable that's shared. Let me see it. Yeah. Count starts over zero. Both threads have access to it. The first thread, which is the increment thread, it goes to sleep. I think we did this just to speed it up for a half a second. Remember, this is milliseconds, so <coughs> 500 would be 500 milliseconds, which would be a half a real second. So this goes to sleep for, so this is now this thread, like on the diagram before, it's putting itself to sleep, and then when time is up, it'll get moved back to ready. So we're going to, we want to increment the count variable. <coughs> and just to be safe, I forget if we added this last time, but just to be safe, we're going to call synchronize on this variable, which basically says that once I hit this open paren, from this open paren to this closed paren, any other thread that does a synchronize on this variable will have to wait. So it'll get stuck until we complete what we're doing. Now we're only doing one line of code. This could be a lot of code. And then that would stop other threads from entering their block until we're done. <coughs> so then we just, and then we output whatever the value is. So this thread will just make a 0 a 1, output a 1. Make it a 2, output a 2. Keep doing that forever. Does it every half of a second. Keeps going to sleep and waking up. Then we had a reset thread, which basically took whatever the value is and cut it in half. And this one we had run once every 5 seconds. So we had this go to sleep for 5 seconds. Then we said, again, synchronize on the same variable. And then we said its value equals its value minus 1. Now, the, again, the reason, just to recap on what the synchronizing is, if, if this line of code actually turned into several lines of assembly code, this code might look like grab the value of count, step one, get the value of count from memory, step two, perform a computation within the processor, take that value and divide it by two, and then the third step would be to write the result back to memory. So this one line would really turn into three lines. And what we'd like to not have happen is, let's say the value of count is 10 at the moment. And this thread comes in, reads 10, divides it in half and stores a 5, and then this thread timed out. And then we went back to this thread. This thread now, the 5 did not get written back to memory, so 10 is still in the memory location. This thread would then add 1 to 10, making it 11, store 11 back, and then we pick up where we left off, and store five back. And then, not that this really matters. This is just a, a an, you know a uh, demonstrative example. But in the real world, this could be like a bank account, and we don't want the bank. You know, some process trying to do something like add. Let's say that add one was adding interest to an account. We don't want to lose the interest because this thread was in the middle of processing when it timed out. So what we do is we say synchronize on the variable, and then as soon as this open print starts. If anywhere in this processing, 
And again, this is one line, but it turns into several lines in assembly, but we could have had 100 lines. As soon as you went to the open paren, if you time out somewhere in the middle of this processing, you'll time out. If another thread comes along and wants to enter the same variable, it's going to get stuck. It can't get past here. So it will then get suspended here. You'll then be able to finish where you left off until you get to the close paren, and then this one can start. So that's, it's a safety thing. And just a reminder, what we said last class is we could also make the entire method synchronized instead of just the section being synchronized. What we're doing here is we're saying, when you say synchronize on a, on a variable, from the open print to the closed print, it's synchronized. Then after that, it becomes a free-for-all again. Anybody can go in any order. <clears throat> so we could take the whole, we could make the whole method synchronized. And then anybody calling a synchronized method, as soon as the method starts, no other object, no other thread could call a synchronized method on the same object. Now that's, you know, it's great for protection-wise, but if the method that you made synchronized is very long, you're going to stop all the other threads. So it's safe, but it could be time consuming. So it's a trade-off. You have the option to say, I only want to synchronize from here to here, or I can synchronize on the entire method. You might synchronize on entire methods if the methods are really short and you don't have to worry about one thread holding up a whole bunch of other threads. <coughs> okay, so now in this case, it's the same idea as before, but we're just going to add two new things. So we'll, we'll add that suspend and resume feature. And the body changes if we added a little bit more to the body. <coughs> so what we decided to do was, this was the same as last time, we create thread one, give it a name, we create thread two, and then we start the two threads. So you got the parent thread and the two children thread run. And last time, what's below here wasn't there. So this is what's new. So we have the parent thread, after it kicks off the two children thread, we have the parent thread go to sleep for 15 seconds. And then it suspends, the parent is saying to suspend one of the children. So the parent is saying, take thread one and make it stop. Then the parent thread keeps running. The parent puts itself to sleep for 10 more seconds. And then it lets the thread one resume. So what effect do you think this would have? So remember, without this stuff, thread one and thread two run. <coughs> the count variable started off at zero, went one, two, three, four, five. So it was going for a half a second. So it would count up to 10. Then the other thread would wake up five seconds later and cut it in half to five. Then it would go six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, goes to 15, get cut in half to seven. Then it would count up to 17, get cut in half. But now, after 15 seconds after these two threads start, the parent is going to make thread one stop. It's going to suspend it. So again, the, the only difference between going to sleep and a suspend is who's causing the thread to stop. With sleep, you put yourself to sleep. With suspend, the parent is saying, I'm putting the child to sleep. Kind of. And when you put yourself to sleep, you give yourself an amount of time. But when you suspend something, it stays suspended until the, the thread that suspended it tells it you can now resume. So it's just, like, again, it's just different ways that threads can start and stop each other. So what would you think would happen now? So thread one and thread two would run. You'd expect, you'd expect the output to be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It would cut to five. Now we're already ten seconds in. It would go six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And at somewhere around that point, the parent would suspend the thread that keeps incrementing the count. But the second child would keep running. The one that the one that every five seconds cuts it in half, that'll keep running. So we'd expect the output to go something like um, we would expect the output to go something like zero, one, one, two, three, four, five, up to ten, cut to five, count up to around fifteen or so, and then it'll stop incrementing. And it should just sit there doing nothing. And then about five seconds later, the value will get cut in hand. 
and then another five seconds later, it'll probably get cut in half again. So it might go from like 15 to 7 to 3, and then it'll start counting up again, 4, 5, 6, for another 10 seconds. And then here's another routine we could call. We can we could have the parent thread at a certain point in time just call stop on the thread to end the thread. Okay, and now here's another question. I just threw this in. If you started a thread at some point and then it finished, either naturally finished or like, like in this case, these threads run forever. Right? These are these are wild true true threads, so they run forever. So you could actually call a stop, you could have the parent call stop on. If the thread naturally stopped or had it had the stop method called and then you started it again, would you expect it like that you could keep starting and stopping the thread from the parent? I'm not sure uh, what would be the lot like would you allow if you're designing the Java language, would you allow restarts of threads? Obviously you wouldn't start you wouldn't have the same thread running twice. It would cause too much confusion. But if the, if the thread naturally finished, then the parents said, hey, I'd like to stop that one again. Would you not allow it or, or allow it? It turns out, well, I, I just threw this in. It turns out that once you start a thread, once you create an object and start its, you start its thread by calling the start method, which actually creates the thread and then runs the run method. You can only run it once. You have, if you want to run the same thread again, you have to create another object of the same type and run it again. They won't let you keep running the same thread over and over. <laughs> so this would actually, uh, you know, if this will be a compiler error or at runtime, it'll say, you know, something along the lines of you already, you already ran these threads, you shouldn't be running them again. But anyway, so let's see if the, if the running of this is, uh, what we expected. cuts it in half every five seconds is still running. So it cut it from eight to four, maybe it'll go to two. And then the incrementing thread will start running again. Now, now the two threads are competing with each other, so again, it's being cut in half. And then we, after a certain amount of time, we pull stop on both of these. And then this is the, yeah, this is the problem we're getting because we're trying to, it's not the most intuitive um, answer, but we're trying to restart the thread. So, let me just uh, let me get rid of that so we convince ourselves that, that this, is the, uh, this is the error. We need to comment these out. But I just wanted to you know, illustrate the fact that you can't, um, you can't restart a thread once it has run. This is, this is just a method, this is a message saying that they're going to be getting rid of an upcoming version of Java, or it's a deprecated function that will be so it's suspend, but it still works. So now, uh, we run it now, we shouldn't get that error at the end. So again, this is just, um, So we ended up having 
from the point where they were both, um, from the point where that was, it was suspended, 10 seconds went by, we let it resume. Then another 10 seconds goes by and it should stop. And, uh, oh, okay, the reason why it's kept, it kept it up and looked like 20 is because we're doing every half a second, right? We're incrementing every half a second. It just seemed like both the sleeping part was off, so, okay. So does, that, so does that make sense that what's happening, this is now just a new way, again, we have all these threads, you know, these threads running kind of randomly. They run for a fraction of a second. We don't even control how long they run. They just run for a fraction of a second. And then uh, based on our application, we might want some threads to stop for a little while and let something else do some processing, then wake it up again. So here's an opportunity for the parent thread to say I want to suspend one of the children threads. Then at some late, after it's done whatever it is we're doing, we're just wasting 10 seconds here to make a point, but we could be doing something. For some reason, between here and here, we don't want thread one running. So we suspend it, do whatever we gotta do, and then let it start running again. And then once again, like for what we're doing with our project, having a clock that runs forever, we could decide to have a stop method. Like some, you know, we could have some button on our clock that if someone hits it, the clock shuts off. So something hitting it could be stopping all your threads. Okay, then um, go over another example. What did you do to uh, override the compile here? Oh no, the run. The, uh, wait, sorry, wait. the runtime here. The run. Um, no, I, I commented out the lines that restarted the thread. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically that that's not it wasn't a very good um, error message, but uh, it basically does you know you're only allowed to run the thread one time uh, in your program. If you want to, so if you wanted the same functionality to run many times in your program, just create another object of that type and we'll and we'll start again. <laughs> okay, so let's see we have. Uh, This is an example illustrating a deadlock. Okay. In this example, we have a process. Process A implements runnable, so it can run as a thread. <clears throat> we print out a message called process A attempting to get resource X. So in this case, there's two resources. Now, let's say um, in the last example, we had a variable called count. You had to have access to count, right? You had to do synchronized on count and then you can proceed. So that, that was one resource you had to get. Now suppose your program has multiple, you have to get access to multiple resources before you can get started. So if you, again, we could do synchronized methods and then you, every resource you need will be available to you if you can get started in the synchronized method. <coughs> in this case, we're gonna do synchronized on resource X. And I have them declared at the bottom, they're just in <coughs> So only after you get resource X, can you proceed? And, the, and from here to here, you have exclusive access to resource X. If anybody else tried to do a synchronize on resource X, they'll get stuck until you're finished. And then they're allowed to pick up, pick up where you left off. So now what I do in this thread, again, this is just to illustrate the point. I go to sleep for one second. And then I print out now, process A is going to try to get resource Y. So this is to get two resources. Now we would get a second resource, resource Y, and we'd have to nest them because we have to get resource X and then try to get resource Y. And now that I have resource X and Y, I can now do whatever it is I have to do. So this is saying process A has X and Y and it can now do whatever it needs to do. Maybe X and Y is a well, file. You read from one file and you write to another file or something like that. <laughs> and it needs exclusive access to both files before it can, exist, before it can run. Process B is exactly the same with one difference. It goes to get resource Y first and X second. And I did this on purpose because I want these threads to deadlock. If we both ask for X first and Y second, whoever gets X first is the winner and would definitely be able to get Y. But what's happening here is I'm going to kick off these two threads at the same time. The first thread 
<coughs> this one would probably run first, because it, it'll be kicked off first, but it's not guaranteed. This one will run, it will get access to resource X, and then it'll go to sleep. So it'll get moved from runnable to block. And it's stuck there. So this thread might as well run. It's the only one that's in a position to run. It's the only one that's in the runnable state. This one will go to the block state for one second. After one second, it'll move back to the runnable state. So this one will start running. This will go and get resource Y. So it grabs up resource Y, and then it goes to sleep. So now they'll both be asleep for a second. One second later, they'll both wake up. And again, it could be a free fall. I can't say for sure that this one would go next, but this one would try to get resource Y. <coughs> Where is resource Y at this point? At this point, resource Y was already gotten by this one. So this guy says, I have resource, this one grabbed resource Y. So now it enters its code, goes to sleep, and now it tries to get, you know, it prints out this message, tries to get resource X. But it'll end up getting stuck. Because resource X has already been grabbed by this guy. This guy knows, as soon as he entered this code, as soon as this thread entered this code, Nobody is allowed to say synchronize resource X and enter their code. So this thread will get stuck right here. It can't go until this thread gets to this close parent. As soon as this close parent, then this resource is given up, and then we can proceed. But the same problem here is that this thread is trying to get resource Y, which this thread already got. So this thread is going to get stuck right here. So what should happen is this thread after one second. So I'm going to kick these two off. This thread will get this resource, go to sleep. Then this thread will run. This thread will get the Y resource, go to sleep. After one second, they both wake up, and they each try to get the resource that the other guy has. And until the other guy gives it up, until the other guy processes and gets to that close parent, this one will wait. So each one of these is going to wait for the other one. So let me just show how the, the resources are. The resources are really simple. I just, again, we have to have, it has to be a referenceable type. It can't be like an integer, but anything you can create and have a reference to automatically has this locking mechanism built in because it inherits from object and all objects have a lock. So I created resource x and resource y. You sign them a number, but that's really doesn't matter. I'm going to kick off the two, I'm going to create the two threads. I'm going to start the two threads. They should go into a deadlock. And then if, then I'm, the parent thread's going to go to sleep for 10 seconds. <coughs> and then we're going to kill one of the two processes. Now what do you think would happen in this case? Okay, so what would the output, of, what do you expect the output of this program to be? So we're going to have the two threads. The two threads are going to kick off. Assuming thread A went first, but that's not guaranteed. If the parent says start A, start B, it's not guaranteed that A will start first. Because the parent could say start A, and remember the parent and the two children share the time. So the parent could say start A and keep running, and then say start B. By the time they get constructed, they might not get constructed in that particular order. So it's not guaranteed, but it's probably likely that process A would run first. So I'd expect the output to be, <coughs> I would expect the output of this program to be process A attempting to get resource X, and it should get it. Then it should go to sleep. Then I'd expect to see process B attempting to get resource Y. Those two could go out in, in reverse order. But I, I'd probably expect the A to go first, then this one. Then it goes to sleep. Then they would both wake up. Depending on which one woke up first, which, depending on which one got back to ready, you would see process B attempting to get resource X or process A attempting to get resource Y. Whichever one spits that line out first will then immediately get stuck. The other one will then run and spit that line out. It'll get stuck, and then it'll just sit there. Sit there for how long? It'll sit there for, it should then just sit there for, it should, it, well, for, it should never say process A has X and Y and now begin. And it should never say process B has X and Y and let's begin. 
And then what happens? It'll just sit like that. And then 10 seconds later, the parent says, I'm killing process B. And it stops B. Now, after B stops, what would you expect to happen? And this is one I, what, I, what I thought would happen and what happened didn't match. To. But OK, so process A has resource X and is waiting for somebody to give up resource Y so it can continue. B has resource Y and is waiting for somebody to give up X so it can continue. Ten seconds later, the parent comes in and says, I'm killing B. Should it? Should that killing, should that stopping the thread also force it to give up all its resources? If it does, yeah. then A should pick up where it yeah. left off. Yeah. Anyone have a reason why they think it would not? <laughs> that the thread would still keep its resources? I guess there's a little bit more of a design issue. I would have explained, well, yeah, let me run it. same thing. So right now, B has been killed and A is still waiting. And uh, so does that mean that B is like stopped, but it's, it's still there, kind of, so it won't give up B? Yeah, yeah no, well, actually, uh, the thread B dot, the thread B, which is a child of the parent, is no longer running, but it still has the resources. It still has the resource that it grabbed. So, uh, I, yeah, I would have expected them to give up all the resources they have, but they could have some resources and have done some work but not finished their work and might want to bring that thread back to life. So, if, for example, if uh, we created another thread of the same type, it might want to pick up where it left off. So, not sure it's the greatest design. I'm trying to think if we were designing the language, would you? When a thread is stopped, would you would would the stop mechanism force it to give up all the resources it has? I guess that one's kind of debatable. Okay, so uh, that was a, a deadlock example, and then um, well, another thing, I guess I guess it would be kind of it would be too difficult to put an example together that we could uh, see on the, I, I, try to, I try to make the examples that we cover on, uh, on the board, I try to make them, I try to get them to be um, examples that you can see on one screen, you know, when we, when we put them on the, when we show them on the display um, on the computer, but we could, there's another thing we talked about in those states, which was a wait and a notify, so again, suppose we had, in other words, to code up an example, I'd have to write a lot of code, and then I'd be scrolling up and down, you know, on the screen. So it might be better to just do it as kind of a, at a high level uh, on the blackboard. But you could have a thread, thread one. You can have a thread one and a thread two. Okay. And thread one could do something like. No, we'll stick with that supermarket example. So if, uh, we can say, I'm not going to do this like perfect job. I'll just do it like, you know, whiteboard. But I'll just say, um, if the number of customers is, well, if, if the number of customers is greater than, I'm sorry, is less than four, then I'll wait. 
and this would be in a wine fruit. So this is thread one is the uh, thread one is the cashier who works some of the time. Right? Thread two will end up being the cashier who works all of them. So we open a friend and then I'll do you know I'll then call the handle customer. Okay, so this is a cashier who only works if there's four or more customers, okay? And then if there's three or less customers, this cashier goes on a break. And then if the line builds up again, uh, comes back a lot. This is the cashier that works all the time. While true. Uh, now, yeah, it's going to keep handling the next customer, but how can this customer wait? This cashier has to yell out, you know, the supermarket, hey, can you come down and have a turn? So this cashier has to wait up that cashier. So this one will check. Uh, what would you do it first? You can say if number of customers. So I guess there's a third thread that keeps adding customers to the line. <coughs> But if, so this variable, number of customers, is going to be the shared variable that we'd actually want to get a lock on before we start reading and writing something. But like I said, I'm not going to do a perfect job here. I just want to get another point of this. So if the number of customers is greater than three, we want this one to come back to life. And we'll do a notify. Well, notify. And then we can sit, and then we can handle the next customer too. Okay. So now these could be two threads that you kick off forever. Now you might think it's two cashiers that are just saying any customers I'll take them. But this is a customer who, based on a condition. So you know, a condition is usually what's inside an if statement if this condition is true or if this condition is false. So sometimes the, in other programming languages, this would be referred to as, you know, we end up using what's called a condition variable but <laughs> instead of a lot. Now here's one thing that's interesting. Suppose, okay, wait, so first we got the idea. This is, again, a way for threads to stop and start. So we've gone over sleep. You, you put yourself to sleep, you, you set the timer. You're the thread, you put yourself to sleep, you set a timer and you'll wake up when the timer expires. And then we, did, um, we had a case where the parent was shutting off and you know, suspending and resuming the child process. So that's another way. To, so it's, threads can control themselves or have other threads can control or anybody else. <coughs> Here's an example where a thread wants to put itself to sleep, but it doesn't know when it's going to wake up. So if, if it knew it was going to wake up in 30 minutes, it would put itself to sleep in 30 minutes. It wakes up when this thread says, hey, I need help. We have to make customers. So this thread will be checking the shared variable. And if it goes above three, so like I say, there's some third thread apparently that keeps adding and subtracting. Well, every, every time you do, every time you handle a customer, part of this routine would say customer equals number of customers equals customer minus one. We just served another customer. But somehow other customers are entering the store. So there's a third thread somewhere out here that keeps adding customers. And then when the count, the share variable goes above three, this thread says, OK, I need you to wake up again. And then this guy wakes up, handles the next customer. That'll decrement the count, and then it goes back up. And it, keeps, it stays alive as long as there's at least four customers in the system. Once the count goes back below three, it goes back to sleep. So this is where the threads are kind of like talking to each other. One is putting itself to sleep and then hoping somebody else notifies it to wake up. So I think that's a little bit more correct. So, yeah. Okay. And again, you could run yourself into trust. You, if you do a wait, don't put no other code that will wake you up, you can end up going to sleep forever. Right? That's not a deadlock, it just means you don't sleep right. Uh, 
So any other any other real world application where you think that this this scenario where one thread is putting itself to sleep, but it the, you, what you're looking for is the case where a thread needs to put itself to sleep, but it doesn't know when to wake up. And the condition it's a condition, not an amount of time. The condition occurs that obviously some other thread notices. Oh, the condition occurred. Number of customers one above three. That's the condition that means means you have to wake up, and then you hope the other thread is coded to wake you up. So in our project, in our project, we have a to go back and forth. So we have we have an alarm clock. That's one thread is just running the clock to ten one second at the time of day. Because all we really have to do is put locks around the uh, the time of day. You don't want one thread updating hours, minutes, and seconds while the other one is changing. It. Okay. Now here, oh, here's one other thing. So suppose this is. Interesting. Suppose this was a synchronized method. Suppose thread one was synchronized. And thread two was synchronized. Think about the deadlock thing we just went over. What problem would happen? If the, if the first thread was synchronized and made itself wait, so synchronized means if, if this method is running, this entire method is running, nobody's allowed to enter their method. Okay, so if the first guy runs, oh, wait, wait, I can't synchronize with a loop forever. So let me say that we have a synchronized method. And then somewhere else we have a we have a while while true arm. And we then call uh, Fred Wall. In other words, this method gets called, and then when it's done, it gets called again. So this goes on forever. So now you keep every time you do a call, you lock, run it, unlock. Lock, run it, unlock. Lock, run it, unlock. Right? So if it was done that way, so what I'm really getting at, and then this was also uh, while true thread to run. So they keep they keep going and getting the same lock, and this is and you can imagine more of real world examples where this would happen. <clears throat> the code that does the wait first got a lock. So it's halfway through the code, which means this guy can't start. He can't begin his synchronized method until this guy finishes. This guy puts himself to sleep while he has the lock. This guy will never notify him to wake up because he can't get started, right? So what would now, this, this obviously looks like a real serious problem. And it could, it could be not only synchronized methods, or this could be a block inside a synchronized on a variable. But if there's anything, if you ever do a wait while you are in a synchronized section of code, you're gonna you're dead forever, right? So now what they want, so what would if you were designing the language, what would you do in this case? Part of this, remember, wait is a routine provided by job. So it does some stuff. And obviously one thing it's doing is taking this thread and moving it out of the runnable state and moving it over to a block queue so that someone else won't come and move it back. But we could do something else in here. And one thing we could do is we could make it give up this lock. Unlike what we did when, when we called a stop, it didn't right. force all the locks to be given up. But we could make this give up the lock. So this could give up the lock, so this routine can then begin. But then what happens after the wait is done, this should pick up where it left off, but now it's running without the lock. That's not good. So what Java ended up doing in this case is part of the wait routine, if you are holding a lock, you will be giving it up. You give up the lock. And then if somebody notifies you to wake up, before you can proceed, as part of this getting back into the runnable state, you have to re-get this lock. If somebody, if a third routine is currently holding the lock, you'll again have to wait. Right after you come out of the wait state, you'll be waiting again to get the lock. So it's kind of like there's an implicit um, there's an implicit line here that says, like, re-get the lock. 
actually part of the notify is to tell what notify tells all the all the threads that are waiting. It tells you to pick one of them and get that one started, and then whatever locks you had before you have to now read it. So it's safe in that regard. So I just didn't want you to think that oh, if I can I can I put a wait statement inside a synchronized method? You can. Any, any question about that? I know this, this is kind of like the door is wide open for what we can do with this. Because now, now all the threads, not only is it like the parent thread stopping and starting the... the so what, 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 what a street line uh, with, a, with a main street line where a car sits, where you know where they have where the car sits and it has a thing on the ground and that's the street line. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So you mean like in the middle of the night, it's, yeah. it's a red light and right. nobody else is around, right. yeah. you just turn green. Yeah, so yeah, there would be like, there could be a thread running first, a traffic light, that says, you know, after one minute of green, it goes to red, yeah, after one minute, no, it's like the green to yellow to red, right. then after one minute it goes back to green, but you could start putting in conditions that says if no other cars are going the other way, and this guy's red, and I'll just, you know, yeah, maybe go to the green, before they, before they, that's what it should 